Thanks for listening to another life-transforming message from the team here at C3 Southwest Washington. To find out more about our church, visit c3swwa.com. Why don't you remain standing? We want to greet all of you this morning. It's great to see you. Good-looking people inside this room and good-looking people back home. Uh, what a great week ahead. Did you hear what I said? Amen. It's a great week ahead. We're able to live in a country where we're able to cast our vote for our next president. You know what? And uh, it's a great privilege. It's up to you. We get to decide who our leaders are. There's a role that we play and we participate. So excited about this season that we're stepping into. It's November 1st, but we're stepping into something we call November Fast. We'll be preaching on that all this month, but we will be engaging in this experience. I want to invite you to use the month of November to partner with God and step into a brand new year. The year 2021 is coming, and I don't know what it will bring your way, but I do know this, okay, that you can embrace each day and take the ground that Christ gave his life for you to have. There's great things ahead when you and I step in prepared. Let me read this verse to you out of the book of Proverbs, chapter 21, verse 5. It says there, the plans, and I just want to speak this over to you, even prophetically, the plans of the diligent lead to, surely, to abundance. Say that word with me. Abundance. Right? It goes on to say, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. And I don't want to have you read that word, but this is the picture of two different types of paths, two different types of people. And I hope you're drawn to the first half, the, the, the diligent who comes surely to abundance, not the everyone who is hasty who comes to poverty. You know, the picture of hastiness is someone who doesn't necessarily have a plan and unexpected in the Old Testament Hebrew, they are shoved. And in the process of falling over, they catch themselves, maybe grind away some skin, but they reestablish themselves. It's a person without a plan who loses a little bit as they are shoved unexpectedly. But the diligent man, it draws the picture in the Hebrew of a man who has a plan, knows where he's going, knows what he's after, and he experiences the exact same shove, only he responds to the shove, and instead of losing skin, he allows that shove to propel him forward to his goal. He actually takes ground because of the opposition. And I would declare over you that the year of 2021 is a year of abundance for you. That's the heart of God for you. That's the will of God. Now, I want you to know, as we talk about it, it needs to be prepared for. You have a role to play. Let me go ahead and pray over you. Father, I thank you so much for each person here in this room, at home, in the living room, or in the car, traveling, watching later online. Lord, let this be a year. 2021, a year that's been prepared for, a year of the diligent that leads to abundance. God, I pray for your blessing upon your people this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone said, amen and amen. You may be seated. Grab your Bible, and we're going to just press into this topic a little bit farther, and I'm going to try to take some ground as quick as I can. The book of John chapter 10, verse 10, if you spend any time in this church, John chapter 10, verse 10, paints the picture of two similar paths like we've already read out of the book of Proverbs. And there it says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's path number one. It's kind of like being shoved and losing a little skin a little bit along the way. But Jesus goes on to say, I came that they may have life and have it what? Have it abundantly. And so the first point I have for you today is I want you to recognize that your best life, if you give me that on the screen there, Dave, your best life is within reach. That is why Jesus came. That's what I want you to get out of Proverbs and out of John chapter 10, verse 10, that your best life is within reach. As you go back and you look at John chapter 10, verse 10, it describes two different types of life. It describes survival life, number one. As you look through the scripture, it's, it's being pushed and stabilizing yourself, losing a little along the way, but reestablishing yourself. But there's a little bit of stealing, killing, and destroying along the path. When I read John chapter 10, verse 10, the first part, I picture a person who's trying to navigate across a body of water filled with piranhas. Right? And as he makes his way across, he's taking a chunk here, taking a chunk there. And hopefully I survive on, and make my way to the other side. That's the beginning portion of John chapter 10, verse 10. But the second half, Jesus says, but 
I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I picture the same man making his way across the body of water filled with piranhas, but with a net scooping up fish for a fish fry to enjoy at the end that he cooks for himself and his friends. Two different people making their way across the same body of water, but one because of Jesus is able to experience life and life more abundantly. And you can see in these verses the different versions that give you the picture of what I'm talking about. The NIV says that you may have life to the full. The New Living Translation says that you may have a rich and satisfying. Who doesn't want a rich and satisfying life? Raise your hand, right? Uh, The message, I love what it says. I came that they may have real and eternal life, more and better life than they've ever even dreamed of. And that's the word of God that I want to speak over your life today. That is within reach because of Jesus. The very best life or abundant life is within reach because of Jesus. The scripture says, I came that they, what? May. See, without Jesus, it's impossible. You cannot have abundant life. But because of Jesus, now you may have abundant life. That means it's within reach. It doesn't say that they will have. It says that they may have. In other words, it's within grasp. There's this great portion of uh, scripture found in the book of Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, where it paints the imagery of Jesus knocking on the door of the church and also knocking on the door of your life. And I don't know if you've experienced that. Most of you who are believers, I know you have, because we don't find God. God reveals himself to us. And he starts that tapping. He starts that knocking. I was 18 years old. I was at a concert of all things. And while these musicians were up on the, on the stage doing their thing, singing about God, I didn't understand why they were doing that. It's like the Lord began knocking on my soul. I could sense it, something different. And I could, at, for the first time, hear the voice of God. And the scripture goes on to say, if anyone hears my voice and opens up the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. This is something I'm confident that God will do in the life of everyone. Moms, dads, be encouraged. Pray for your son. Pray for your daughter. You can try to teach them the things of God. That's important. You can take them to church. That's important. But the thing you're praying for is the moment that the king of kings steps up, knocks on the door of their life and says, hey, I'm real. I want to get involved with you. And that's a powerful moment that we believe that is the drawing process of God. And the promise there is if we respond, he comes in. Now, I don't know about you. When I first read these verses the first couple of years that I looked at them, I'm like, okay, cool, lunch with Jesus, right? Who wouldn't want to have lunch with Jesus? But really the picture is much bigger than that. It's Jesus coming into your house or he's coming into your life. A lot of people get nervous about having anybody over to their house. Like, I'll go out to lunch with you, but come over to my house. I don't know you. I don't, maybe, maybe you don't clean your house. Maybe I don't want to go into your house. We have some anxieties. I grew up, maybe not like you, but if a knock came at my door, me and my family, we were peeling the blinds open a little bit. We were opening the door because, like, who's coming to our house? I, we, we weren't the type of people that hosted a lot of people. It's an intimate thing to go into someone's house and have a meal with them. And so what Jesus is saying is that he has abundant life. He's knocking on the door and in stepping in, it's not for lunch. It's not just for a meal, but it's to enjoy life with you and to provide you with nourishment and provide you with friendship and provide you with all the things that come with knowing him. The reason why your best life or abundant life is within reach, it's solely because of Jesus. Without Jesus, abundant living is not possible It's survival living. I don't know about you, but I want to have the best life. If I had a choice between a bad car and a good car, I'm choosing the good car. If I had a choice between a good refrigerator and a bad refrigerator, I'm choosing the good refrigerator, a good sandwich, a bad sandwich. So how about good life versus survival life? I want the best life I can have. And the promise of God is that a relationship with Jesus gives us access to that, right? Now, follow me along a little bit more, though, to point number two. Your best life will always be contested, all right? And it's going to be contested by fill in the blank because this is a spiritual principle. Your best life will be contested from the moment you're conceived, right? The moment you're conceived, best life is contested. How do I know that? Abortion's rampant. The best life is taken from some, I think it's 2,700 children a day 
okay? It's one of the reasons why I thank God that we get to vote. I thank God for the nation that we live in. We're pushing forward to see righteous law established. We want the best life for our children, best life for our teenagers, best life for our families. But it will be contested. John chapter 16, verse 33, great promise. Pastor Saxon shared it last week, and I'm here to bring the good news. Yay, in this world you will have trouble. And I say it with a smile. It's a reality. Don't, don't assume something that it is or that it isn't. It's just the promise of the shove. That's all it is. In this world, you're going to get shoved. That trouble means to be pushed. And so you can expect that. The best that God has for you, if it's over there, and you begin to make your way over there, expect to be shoved. Everything in this lifetime is going to fight against God's best for your life. Mark that down. It's going to be contested. It doesn't mean you're not a good person. It doesn't mean God is mad at you. Every time you are shoved, it means you have a pulse, number one. Number two, you have an idea of where you want to go. And number three, somebody doesn't want you to get there. You tracking with that? Yeah. Right? And so your God's best in your life will be contested, sometimes just by the ignorance that his best even exists. Some of you have stepped into this world thinking, well, whatever happens, happens. It's, that must be meant to be. Uh-uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Not at all, okay? Some people are ignorant that God has a best, and so they, it's contested that way. Or it's contested by the failure to take the time to discover what is best. I mean, you can actually capture the heart of God and know what the destination is. And if you don't take the time to do that, when you face a crossroads, you're like, do I go to the left? Do I go to the right? I'm not sure which direction is best. It'll be contested by maybe your refusal to believe that best can be grabbed onto. I don't know why some of us get this in our mind, but we get it in our minds that God would never want me to have best. I'm not worthy. I don't deserve it. I'm not good enough. I should, I, I, I should just settle for something Less than. Listen, God has no, um, God has sons and daughters. There's no, no farther down the tree than that. For each and every one of us, God treats us like a son and daughter, and he has absolute best for us. Believe that he has that for you. Some of, sometimes it's contested by our assumption that it will just show up. It will not. So we are, it's contested by our standing around and waiting for it to just appear. Listen, anything that just appears comes with string attached. God is all about you working to receive the promises that he has for you. Amen. Okay, there's one amen. I hope you said an amen at home. Well, I don't even want to go down the political slide that I could go down there, okay? It'll be contested by the things that try to break you. It will be contested by your own distractions. It will be contested by your temptations for a substitute, an easier fix. It will be contested by your imperfections, your mistakes, your sin. It will be contested by others who don't want you to have God's best. It will be contested by the wicked one. And ultimately, though, as we read John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, take heart. Why? Because I have already overcome the wicked one. In other words, I'm not surprised by the one who will shove you. And as you get shoved, if we're partnered together, I'm going to help you to tack against that adverse wind and bring you to the destination that God has for you. Listen, if you've got some wind blowing against you and you feel like you're off track, partner with Jesus. The contention will take you from where you are and bring you back to the destination of his best. I have made some serious mistakes in my lifetime. <laughs> so, somebody just said, yes, you have. I'll, don't make me come. I will pull this car over. I have made some serious mistakes, but there's no mistake that I have made that has pulled me out of the game where God is not able to redeem as I repent and find myself back in the very best that he has for me. It might take a little longer. It might uh, uh, cause some adjustments to that plan, but God doesn't give up on me because I make a mistake. It is contested, and the ultimate promise is that Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Now, let me give you point number three, and it's the final one. And some of you are like, you still have like 15 minutes left, Pastor Steve. Oh, don't worry. I'll use every last one of them, okay? <laughs> Your best life must be seized. I'm just telling you, it's got to be seized. It is a complete and utter lie that the will of God automatically happens. And I'm going to stand and I'm going to proclaim that to you. That is a lie from the enemy that causes people to slip back into passivity. Yeah. 
The will of God does not automatically happen. You know how I know that? Because it was not the will of God for Adam and Eve to eat the fruit. It was not the will of God for Adam and Eve or anyone else to die. It was not the will of God for the Israelites to become Uh, afraid of giants and live for 40 years out in the desert. It was not the will of God for Aaron to make a golden calf and people to worship it. It was not the will of God for Israel to be stuck in that desert. It was not the will of God for the Israelites to build their city and then have it destroyed and be deported. It was not the will of God for Jesus to not be able to heal the sick in his own hometown. It was not the will of God for Ananias and Sapphira to lie about their offering and die. And ultimately, Matthew 18, 14, it says, it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that any one of these should perish, and yet people still perish. So what you have to understand is as God's best comes into play for you and it's contested, you need to fight for what God has for you. There are many areas of my life that I can look at and say, you know what, that's okay, but that's not best. I can look in my wallet at times. I can look at my health. I can look at my relationships. I can look at the church. I can look at what's going on in society. Listen, do you understand that the reason why we are where we are in politics is because that's where we've let it go? It's not the will of God what's going on. You know why what's going on is going on? Because we didn't do our part. Oh, I got a lot of amens on that one. You know what? Hey, listen, here's the deal. You know what? A ballot did not arrive in heaven. God has not cast his vote in this election. He told Adam and Eve, you have dominion over the earth. I'm asking you to do the right thing. But if you do the wrong thing, you're going to live underneath that. The Lord has left the leadership, especially in our great nation, up to us. And way too many believers, way too many people who have great ideas have, have felt very passive and said, well, whatever, whatever the will of God is, it will just happen. No, it will not. Yes. Not on a political scale and not on a personal scale. God has a best for you. But you're going to have to rise up and see it. Be hungry for it and fight for it. It's going to be contested. And you're going to need to, the kingdom of heaven comes by force, the scripture says. Yeah. We don't just sit back and wait for it to arrive. This is not like the stimulus uh, that we all think we just deserve. Yes, it's been paid for for you, but the heart of God is for you to fight for what he's given for you because you're stuck living on this earth. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 21, I love this. It says, see the Lord your God has set the land before you. The land for the Israelites is God's best. It really is not just a single plot of land. It's John who's looking at his future and selling a piece of property and seeing provision in the future. It's Glenn looking at his future saying, Lord, what do you have for me? I had a business. I sold it. I did well. I have a good job, but I'm dreaming for more. God, what is your best? That's your land. It could be your physical health. It could be the fact that now you're living in a new state. I mean, it's not just a change of location. You shift from one state to another, to one entity to another. When you cross from Portland just over to here, everything changes. It's a different, there's a different covering over this region. You step into a new church. And so, God, your best is at play. What do you have for me? It becomes your land. It's some of those promises that God has spoken that have yet to be fulfilled. It's some of those things that deep down in, you know that shouldn't be in your life. The land becomes the thing that you know that God has for you, but it's almost out of grasp. You, you're, you're stretching. It's not going to just show up and arrive. It needs to be contested for. See the land that has been set for you. What does it say then? Hey, kick back, have a latte. It's, it's, it's Thanksgiving time almost. Get a pumpkin spice latte. Sit back. And heaven will call Jeff Bezos and deliver your best, my best, to you while you watch through the front window. And you'll go out on your porch and pick up the box and cut it open. What? There it is. Is it going to work like that? No, it's not how it worked for the Israelites. You want God's best? There better be something that begins to rise up within you in a fight, in a confidence, and uh, the fact that it's not your best. It's God's best for your life. Jesus came so that you could experience best. Why would you not want that? 
Why would you want to leave that on the table? I don't know about you. I go to the restaurant, every last piece of the good stuff, I eat it, hungry or not. Maybe I put it in a box and take it at home and eat, eat it halfway on the way on the ride, right? I'm not leaving best on the table. It didn't make sense to me. Tips when I was a little kid, you're walking around. Why are those people leaving perfectly good money on the table? I'm going to bring all that with me. I'm taking best. Listen, God has best for you. It's so important for you to dream about that. So important for you to get a word for that. So important for you to, to gain a divine discontentment in, in, in the land that you own, which might include your company, might include your children, grandchildren, people in a ministry that you're involved with, circumstances that you intersect with. That is your land. And God said, go up and take possession as the Lord, the God of your fathers has told you. And he goes on to say, do not fear or dis be dismayed. You know why? Because there's going to be a lot of pushing in the process. Do not be afraid of the pushing. Anybody you've been experiencing some pushing? You still got some prayer requests on your prayer list, right? You know why? Because there's pushing. There's a fight to see God's best done in our lives. And that's really what, bottom line, where we find ourselves stepping into the month of November for November fast. It's a time to pause, to get together with God, and to look ahead and figure out, Lord, where am I? Lord, where should I be? And how can I get from here to there in all the various areas of your life. Because remember, the hasty man or the man with no plan, when he gets pushed, he ends up being nudged a little bit this way and then a little bit that way, and he ends up what? In poverty. Or in other words, he is drained one drop at a time. But the man who's diligent, the man who's working his plan, his and God's plan, he gets pushed, and instead of falling to the side or being nudged off, he uses that push to propel him forward. And so that is why we step into a season of prayer and fasting. And so really quick, I just want to invite you to consider jumping in to November fast with us. It'll be 30 days where you spend some time in the Word of God. We're going to be going through the book of Proverbs. It's going to be a season of you building a prayer list. We've provided one for you on the website that you can download and personalize. It'll be a day where there's a, a video upload for you to take a look at and be challenged. Maybe a little bit of discovery to help you to add to what you're praying about for the future. Some maybe different perspective, some input on how to be effective in your prayer time. But I am telling you that the year 2021 is going to be a year of abundance for some of you. Amen. I'm telling you, I, I want you to, I want, I, listen, a small adjustment in this moment can change the trajectory significantly over 25 yards, 50 yards, 75 yards, 100 yards. Those of you who use a rifle, who dial in your scope and use the windage knobs and all that to set the scope, know that one click turns into inches over 100 yards, right? Back last year, our church family were a part of helping to start a church plant in Frisco, Texas. And as a church, we flew down there. I flew down there with Pastor Kerry, Pastor Rion. We were sponsoring them, uh, over them in the immigration process coming from, um, from Australia to the Texas area. And so we went down, and while we were there, we happened to bump into somebody who was pastoring a church down there. They happened to be called C3 Frisco. However, it was not a C3 as we understand our church family. So we met with them just because of the similarity in name. We didn't want to cause a problem. And in the process, that led to that man leaving the church and going back to his home country of Canada. And the church was dwindled in numbers, almost out of money, needing a pastor, feeling disconnected from the organization that they were part of. And so they invited me to come down and meet with them to discover what would it look like if they jumped into what we were doing. And I can tell you, when I arrived on that first night, I got, I got a friend who lived in the area to help me out. His name is Bob Carlson. He was a previous C3 pastor. And we went into a meeting with this board to talk to them about their church. And I'm telling you, everyone in the room, the, the, the board members, they were, they were leaning over. Their faces looked tired. You could hear in their voice this, this weariness, this desperation. We think we're coming to an end. We've got $700,000 worth of debt. We, we've got buildings that we're probably going to lose. We love each other. We want a future. What do, we, what do we do? And we explained to them, well, the real decision here is, would you like to join our thing? Because 
Uh, we're not for hire. We have a vision, and if you want to be a part of what we're doing, we would gladly welcome you in. So they took a month to pray, pray, uh, pray over that and got back to me and said, we believe we want to be in. So we flew Pastor Kerry out to uh, Frisco, Texas. He spent a week with them, and then he went back, and then we had more dialogue. And in March, we flew him out there, and this thing really began to shift in an incredible way. But what I want you to know, between those two spots was a whole lot of planning and preparation and diligence, Okay. There's the thing that we, we had this, we begin to get this vision of a church planted there, of maybe being able to keep these people, maybe be able to keep these properties, maybe to be able to have a strong C3 church. You couldn't see it with your eyes because when you looked, you saw a fragmented group of people that were broke and going to lose everything. But how many of you know it's not by sight? It's what God says. I don't care how it looks. When God whispers true vision to you, it doesn't matter what you see. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter how the calculator works out. It doesn't matter the bad report. Once you've heard from God, regardless of sight, you can see it and you begin to make your way to his best. So here's where we are as of today. Uh, Pastor Kerry, last week after our church prayed and so many good things on, he's got a, an appointment on Tuesday with a consulate in New Zealand to get the approval to fly to Frisco, Texas with his card, okay? His visa has been basically approved at this point. Be praying on Tuesday. The second thing that has happened, this church that is weary because of this plan has gone from quiet and sad and struggling. What Last time I was there during prayer time, Man, I'm so proud of you this morning. We prayed about a thousand times at decibel ten or a thousand, and you guys pushed into prayer. You, you you're aggressively pursuing prayer and the things that God has for you. It's the same thing that's happening in that church. It's remarkable. The worship is lively. Some people have been added, a few musicians, some new people. The finances have about, I want to say, tripled at this point. Okay, they're able to pay their bills, but here's even cooler. We've been able to be, as of today, we were $700,000 in debt. The church is now debt-free with $150,000 in the bank, okay? Super. And then a step further, we're about to close on the final sale of the current property. And when Pastor Kerry lands, he is going to land to start the church with about $1.3 million in the bank. And a group of people that are so excited about what's ahead. Is it all about the money? No, but you know, I'm going to tell you what. Money's really spiritual if you need to do something spiritual because even spiritual things cost money, right? Okay, so I want you to stand with me. I want to pray over you. They're going to go ahead and put up a, uh, a Q, uh, what do they call it, a QR code. If you use your camera on this, this will take you to the registration website for our November fast. This, again, will um, include some some opportunities for prayer each day, fasting each day, goal setting for each day. Uh, it'll get into physical fast, uh, food fast, all sorts of different things. But we want to help you to be able to push forward. If you, if you take a picture of this later on on your camera, it will take you to a website directly. You'll be able to register. And if you register, you're going to need a journal for this. We will give you one of our C3 journals on the way out if you commit to registering and being a part of this, okay? And what I want you to do is to step in to this season, into this moment, with a vision for God's best. God's best. I was talking with somebody this morning. They got some good things that are working out, and they said to me, we're just hoping that, and, and I could tell in the voice, his voice, it was really the more don't get your hopes up because who wants to be devastated when things don't work out? That is a posture that the enemy will bend you down into if you allow it. Stand up. Put your shoulders out. Man of God, woman of God, son and daughter of the king. Jesus came so that you could have abundant life in spite of your ridiculousness and your stupidity and your mistakes. He invites you to stand up your shoulders out. Get your hopes up. Get your hopes up. Your hope will affect your posture. It'll loosen your tongue and you'll start declaring the goodness of God. It is the will of God for my marriage to be healthy. 
It is the will of God for me to prosper. It is the will of God for me to walk in freedom. It is the will of God for my wife to be healthy. It is the will of God for these chains to fall off. It is the will of God for me to succeed. It is the will of God for them to say yes. You begin to speak that out over your future. Three things that this this season is going to do for some of you. It's going to help you to see, number one, where you are. You got to figure out where you are. I called up my grandfather one time. I said, hey, how do I get home? He's like, well, where are you? I said, well, I don't know. I'm lost. I said, Steve, I can't tell you how to get to where you want to go if you don't know where you are. We're going to spend some time figuring out where are you at? Why are you experiencing what you're experiencing? Where has God been in your 2020? Because if he's not been in the right place, that's some of why... 2020 has looked the way it has. But that's not the bad news. Is That's good news. Figure out where you're at. And then catch the wind in the sail of where God says you need to go, who you need to be, what you're going to do to become it. And then as you catch the vision for that and you begin to write it down, God will begin to show you these are the steps you need to take. Because it's always one step at a time. It's a journey. You don't just show up the next day. But you begin to take steps. Do you have a vision? I just bow your head just for a second with me. Some of you already know that you're not experiencing best in your life right now. It might be less than best in your body. Maybe you're struggling with, with health. Maybe you're struggling in, in maybe just your, your, uh, your confidence for good things to come your way. You understand that that is, it's at the heart of God. You're actually believing a lie. You're doubting the promises of God. God wants to help shift that in your world. You need to hear that. God has a good career. He has a good future for you. He wants to help you financially. Just as you stand there, I want you just to pray over yourself. And and as we pray together, the first thing that you need to do in order to even begin this journey is to make sure that Jesus is in his rightful place. He's not part of the team. He is the team leader. He is first in your life. He is Lord. He's not just friend. He is Lord. He is king. And I want you to invite him to be first in your life. And if it's the first time or it's, the 10th time you've had to do this because sometimes we get shifted. Right now, start there. Father, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Jesus, come on, pray with me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I invite you to take control of my life. Jesus, we invite you to take your proper place. And as you do, give us a sense, God, of where we are as we step into this season. Give us a sense of where you want us to go. Give us a sense that because you are first, God, you can do all things. God, I pray right now over every person inside this room, every person who's at home. God, I pray over each person. God, I'm believing you, God, for a vision for best, personal best, family best. Uh, 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 God, church best, community best. Give them a vision for national best. God, and in the process, let let hope arise. Let faith arise. Let there be a stirring, God, and excitement, and expectation, a realization that this is in play. And that, God, you begin to help them pen out the way as they begin to partner, God, towards the future. We say yes to you. We say yes to your best. Yes to your best. Yes to your best. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And amen. Amen. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our pastors, leaders, and what we do at C3 Church, visit our website at c3swwa.com.